Philippe Cousteau is the grandchild of explorer Jacques Cousteau. He's an Emmy-nominated TV host and author who just launched the first installment of his new book series, The Endangered. It's a great title. He also serves on the National Council of the World Wildlife Fund, where he's a partner in their nat natural security campaign, the sponsor of today's event. Uh, Philippe, great to see you. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I remember well hanging out with you in Lisbon at the Web Summit. So let me just start out when you were Web Summit, because that's a, you know one of the last times I traveled. I feel like you know like a long time ago. But, long time but for ago, those right? of you, yeah, for those of you who don't know the Web Summit, the Web Summit in Lisbon is attended by seventy thousand mostly young, there are some old folks like me, but you know, folks that I would call the kind of next generation digitati. And I was so impressed with how you, in a way, became a rock star in this group by connecting their aspirations, what they were trying to do. So I'd love you to kind of talk about how you communicate, how do you connect with generations of people you know, that, to, to get them to understand the priority of what we're talking about today. Well, Steve, you know, it's a, it's a great point. And I think that the good news is that we find young people today are much more connected to the world around them, are much more engaged in these issues. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, when we were growing up, um, you know, our friends were people in our communities, people in our school. Now we have young people through the work I do at Earth Echo, uh, my nonprofit, you know, we have young people that have friends all over the world through social media and through digital media. And so it's a much more connected world. And that's the good news, because I think one of the challenges we've had, and some of the previous speakers have, have pointed this out, is that we've done a poor job in the environmental community of connecting the dots around how these issues affect us. You know, still today, we, we have polar bears as the poster child of climate change, when I think we should be having people as the poster uh, and, and children is the poster children of climate change because right. these issues are affecting our health and our security as we're talking about today. And so connecting the dots, young people understand that. They understand that when we talk about uh, 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 the environment and conservation, we're really talking about their health, their, their economic prospects um, and security around the world. Well, to that end, I, I should mention that you just tweeted out a picture of your 17 month old daughter and said, this is who, you know, why we're doing what we should doing. It was very moving. I actually uh, loved that tweet. Um, let me just ask you, you know, with Earth Echo, when you kind of look around, Amer I mean, you travel all around the world, do you think, how do I ask this in the right way? Do you think Americans get it? Do you feel that they're feeling uh, that, that they are pressure sensitive to the changes right now? Um, I know you see it internationally. I'm just wondering what you see in this country. Well, you know, there's a lot of good news there, too, Steve. And, and to, to you mention that tweet, that photo that I posted of my little daughter, Vivienne, who's 18 months now. You know, I'm 40 years old this year. 40 years ago, when I was her age, um, the world was a much richer place from the perspective of biodiversity. We've lost half the amount of biodiversity on this planet in 40 years in my lifetime. And I look at her mm. and I think every day, what kind of a world, how dare we pass that kind of a diminished world on to her? And yet today, I know that uh, some of the uh, members of Congress earlier were talking a little bit about the, the partisan nature, the unfortunate partisan nature of environmental conversations today. And yet, if you go back, you don't even have to go back to Teddy Roosevelt. You can go back to Richard Nixon, who founded the EPA, NOAA, created the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act extension, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. This has historically been a bipartisan issue in this country. And we can get back to that. In fact, a recent study uh, by Pew Charitable Trust found that young Republicans, more than half of young Republicans believe the U.S. government is not doing enough to combat climate change. Mm. And that's a two to one increase over baby boomers, uh, Republicans who, who believe uh, much less in climate change and the issue. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a trend going in the right direction. We're seeing young people that are beginning to embrace this issue. And we're also seeing in the recent election um, a major motivating factor for Biden's win and for the, the, the historic uh, increase in the youth vote. Uh, in support of his campaign was climate change. That was a major motivating factor for this recent election. And so I think everybody bipartisan across the board needs to get on board. And what you're finding is younger Republicans care about these issues. So that's the good news in this country as well. Tell us about your book, The Endangered. Well, The Endangered, it's, it's, uh, it's a brand new book with HarperCollins. We uh, just came out about a month ago. It's a middle grade reader book targeted to eight to 12 year olds. And it's a, it's a fiction story because, you know, again, connecting the dots, Serious documentaries, reports, op-eds, all that stuff's really important, but we also need to be able to tell stories that engage a younger generation. And fiction is a great way to do that. It's a story of a motley crew of endangered species that come together mm. and um, like an A-team for nature, they travel the world uh, because they've achieved hyper-intelligence, this special secret serum, and they thwart conspiracies against nature. 
all over. So it's gotten great reviews. It's been it's a lot of fun, and it's just a, another way to engage uh, young people in these kinds of conversations. And that's that's I think critical if we're going to build the cultural and social foundation in society in order to support the political will that we need in order to make progress, bipartisan progress on these issues. Philippe, I want to ask you a question, and I'm not sure I'm going to get it right, but I want to you know, try to put it out there, which is, you know, oftentimes when, if I'm doing a global affairs national security forum, we're discussing natural security and national security today, I'm often torn between some bank shot that's out there on achieving security, some way to, you know, change the way that people think or whatever, versus incremental earnestness, you know, the straight line, let's move a little bit forward. And, and, and there's a tension between these two, the between strategic leaps and, and others. And, and a lot of people have said you're not going to get the kinds of impacts on natural security until you begin to get um, economic pricing into this, unless you have a way to price carbon, unless you way to price old forests, unless you way to have to you know, price the value of the oceans, that the way the economic equations are stacked is that they're stacked against the polar bear and they're stacked against kids because it's hard to find the dollar value of what you're losing. So I know that's very wonky, but I'm, I know you've thought it about through some of these issues. You know, when your grandfather was doing this stuff, there was an incredible mystique in terms of what he was showing and opening for the first time. Now the question is, are there dollars that can be applied to these things so that gravity can help us get to some better outcomes easier than we otherwise would? Does that make sense? Well, I think there's it does, Stephen. And I think there's two factors at play here. One of the factors is that it, it's, it is difficult to begin to look at, you know, how do we price externalities, essentially, is what we're talking about. How do we price the externalities, the true costs of the destruction of fossil fuels, of, you know, unsustainable agriculture, et cetera, into the price of those goods and services and start to level the playing field? You know, it's a trillion dollars a year that we spend around the world in subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. Um, a trillion dollars. So how do we combat that and begin to recognize that we need to at least give a level playing field for fossil for renewable energy? Um, and, and so the economics are very important. But I do think that, that the direct economics of investment and um, uh, pricing externalities is one factor. But several of the speakers earlier have also pointed out just the raw cost of inaction. Uh, I want to share a quick story with you. Um, the Somali piracy crisis. A lot of people don't recognize that when that started to... Uh, grow in the 1990s and, and 2000s, uh, and has subsequently cost tens, hundreds of billions of dollars to the global economy, threatened the roughly 9 to 10% of global trade that passes through the Suez Canal. That has its roots in conservation. Uh, originally, the pirates were uh, uh, protecting their fishing grounds, their historical fishing grounds that were being plundered by illegal fishing from the EU, Russia, China um, in the 1990s and the 2000s when the Somali state was unable to protect those waters. They were pulling out $300 million worth of fish a year. And these fishermen were no longer able to feed their families. Hmm. And so what any of us would do is they fought to protect that resource. Hmm. And that grew into what became this piracy crisis. And there's, and I actually have it here. I want to, I want to read it to you. There's a summary of a Department of Defense report that says, and I quote, simply spending a few million dollars on protecting fish habitats could have prevented violent extremist groups from metastasizing in East Africa, costing more lives and billions in treasure. Because of course, much of the income from the piracy crisis has funded organizations like Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, etc. So when we start to connect the dots right. between terrorism, uh, these kinds of environmental degradation, imagine that, a few million dollars of fisheries conservation. It mimics what several speakers spoke about earlier, the cost of, of combating the destruction of nature that has led to zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, what cost tens of billions, whereas the cost of dealing with this after the facts cost tens of trillions. And so I think that, that, that that's important to recognize too, is that inaction costs us a great deal of money. Action, as Eileen was talking about, investing in renewable energy can provide opportunity to create more income. And so there's two elements that we're talking about here. Um, and two consequences for our economy in, in, in action and action. I'm so great, grateful that you kind of talked about how those lines come together. I mean, I, I follow a lot on, you know, kind of global terrorism issues. If you, you know, get beneath a lot of the terrorism uh, issues and the way it's playing, there are grievances out there. And a lot of those grievances are economic. There, you know, there, there are various dimensions of that, of people having lost um, livelihoods and, and whatnot. So uh, I love the fact that you made that. And just to quick 30 seconds, I'd love to hear what Echo Star so next big projects are, what do you need to succeed? What are the pieces and collaborations you think that would give you 
you know, greater surround sound echo effect. Um, I should say echo effects of echo effect. <laughs> well, you know, at Earth Echo, what we're really looking at is how do we continue to build that global youth movement? How do we enhance that? How do we connect the dots between how young people drive social and cultural change in society? Because right. we can have a lot of effort and investment, uh, which the environmental movement has, has in big conservation projects, changing laws, et cetera. But unless we have the cultural and social foundation to support right. that long term, it's not going to be sustainable. And that's where we've underinvested in the environmental movement. Mm. We've underinvested in education. We've underinvested in recognizing young people move the needle socially and culturally. And that's what we need to have so that we d stop electing officials that deny science, basic fundamentals of science and, and the reality of climate change and instead come together and solve these problems. Well, Philippe Cousteau, founder of Earth Echo International, I saw you capture the imaginations and attention of a lot of people in uh, the Web Summit in Lisbon a couple years back, and I, yeah, I think you did it again today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. It was a, it was a pleasure.